I am going to talk to you about the Ruby Shell. Um, yeah, first a little bit about me. I'm Steve. Uh, I get paid to do cool stuff at Springbuck. Uh, we're hiring, so anybody is, if you're like the one developer looking for a job right now, then feel free to visit our website. Um, yeah, so let's just go ahead and start in. Talk about what a shell is. When I, what do I mean by when I say the Ruby shell? Um, the shell is just a term for like a CLI or a command line interface or some sort of interface to access the computer's CPU and resources. Uh, and you interact with the computer and tell what to do by giving it commands. And so when I say a Ruby shell, what I'm saying is a interface to access the computer that uses Ruby and is this way to command what to do. And some examples that you may have used are IRB, which is the uh, Ruby shell baked into Ruby core, uh, Pry, which is an alternative, and the Rails console, which I didn't look into the source code, but I'm pretty sure it's just like IRB with um, that loads up your whole Rails environment. Anyway, so I want to know what to what they're like, so I decided to start by building my own, and I'm going to kind of walk you guys through some of the steps I took to build it, and as, as a way of learning, so you can kind of follow along with some of the challenges and. Uh, Kind of the cool stuff that you can do with Ruby to make it like you can you can write Ruby to evaluate Ruby. Anyway, so let's talk about one of the some of the stuff we want in Ruby shell. For one, we would like to receive input and evaluate as Ruby. That's pretty much the like bare minimum you look for in a shell. And right off the bat, that's kind of a weird question to ask because I don't think anyone commonly writes code that is made to evaluate other code when you think about it. Most of your time your code is trying to do something outside of the code. But in this case we, re we literally just want code that is able to read essentially itself and then be able to know what to do with that. And so let's just start off with how do we capture user input. This is fairly trivial. Uh, they teach you like the first thing in a computer science course, but it's basically something you never do with like product applications because you have better interfaces than a command line. Uh, but it's just kernel dot gets or just gets in uh, the Ruby. Like all it does is wait for uh, the user to type something, and then as soon as they press enter, it throws that into a string. And makes it available to the program, and you can assign that you can assign that return value to a variable or whatever you want. So, as an example, uh, here's a really simple script that all it does is uh, defines a variable cmd, short for command. I had to make it shorter just because the slides don't have unlimited room. Uh, and so you just assign that to a variable and then I just output it right away. And over there you can see where I ran it. So just a Ruby script, so I call Ruby and then the file name. And then I typed hello ndrb and it spit it back out. Uh, a couple things to note is that I have to add in the chomp method to the string because all the, and that just strips the uh, new line character from the end. Because the new line character, while it, it serves like two purposes. A, it's a new line character, and B, it tells it to evaluate gets. Anyway, so now how could we evaluate that as Ruby? That's a little trickier, uh, but it's when you. It seems like it'd be trickier, but really it's just about as trivial. There's another kernel method for that, and it's just a val. And what a val does is it accepts a string and a couple optional parameters that we'll talk about later, and it will run it and then give you the return result of what the string you provided it as Ruby afterwards. So here's a quick example of that. Uh, in this case, I use the same, I use a get input method to receive, like to capture the, what the user types. 
and then we pass that right on to kernel .val and then print it back out. So uh, on the right side of the screen, I just typed in two times two and it spits out four, which is correct, I believe. And then uh, just a little more, a little more Ruby specific, I use the arrange and map to calculate the first five squares. No, first five. Make multiply the first five numbers times two. So yeah, that's actually super easy, much easier than I expected. And so we can throw that into a quick script. Uh, in this case, I'm ca capturing all of my like shell into a class, and that's just because it's it's. I kind of thought it would get super complicated later, and it's just easier to reason about things in an object-oriented manner. So uh, the class, it's just a standard class, and then it has a run method. And then I didn't post it up here, but there's another. There's a file that all it does is create a new instance of the shell object, and then hits the like calls the run command. Anyway, so we create a while loop. And that just is basically saying, like, just evaluate everything inside this block until I tell you to not to. We get the uh, input with gets. I provided a way for me to break up, for me to break out of this shell with just by typing quit, and otherwise it will pass the command onto kernel eval and print it out. And. Oh, that's real small, isn't it? Well, it works. <laughs> I call Ruby. Let's see if I can make that gift bigger. That's a little better. They're really impressed with the shell. <laughs> so yeah, we. I threw it. I threw the entry point into shell RV, and it does some Ruby. It can add one plus one. It can reverse an array, and it can do something with a range from one to five that I don't remember. Anyway, so that's that's great and all, but sometimes you make a typo when you're writing Ruby, and you don't necessarily want the whole program to bomb because of it. And with this current stage. If I type in something that is not valid Ruby, for instance, nil.each, you'll receive a no method error. It will spit out the backtrace and the uh, error, but then it will go right back to the shell rather than into our, or the uh, batch rather than our Ruby shell, as you can see from the bottom. And so that's not great. Uh, but that's also pretty easy to fix. Uh, we just can just use the a rescue method and that will just capture the error and then print it back out to the, the uh, terminal. And with that, now we get a much less verbose error message, but more crucially, we stay in the Ruby shell that we've written. I didn't show it here, but it's not, this little uh, uh, dollar sign is the terminal prompt. So the, the fact that we don't see it there means we're still in the shell program. So next up, if you're writing a code, like a script over multiple lines, which like you, if you're doing anything more complicated than what I've shown so far, then you definitely want to be able to write a program over mo multiple lines. You want to be able to assign variables and classes, modules, etc., uh, methods for that matter. And it may look like it works, but it really doesn't because right now the uh, if I assign a variable a, it does it just like forgets that it exists when the next time I enter a command. Also, I added a uh, greater than sign just to make it clear when I'm in, what I'm inputting and what I'm outputting. So yeah, that's not great. Uh, and that's this was the first like minor hurdle I had to get over. And the way you do that is by using what's known as a binding in Ruby. And binding is this thing that you should you basically never have to think about in a well-designed application. But what it represents is the context of the current, the current scope, all the variables assigned to it, 
and uh, kind of like what the parent level bindings, but not the child level bindings. So when you open a file, like when I start a new program, uh, you have a top level binding. Every time you define a, a block, uh, a class, a method, anything, it creates a new binding. And it, that bind, that's why you can't access local variables from another method in, or from, from another method in another method. And that's just because like, the bindings don't intersect, so it doesn't know anything about it. Uh, and here's an example of that being used. I can define some method, and I will assign a local variable. And when I try to access that same variable later, in this case it's just some variable, I get a name error because it doesn't know it exists. And that's because this method block has its own separate binding that is and that doesn't know anything about the, or rather reverse that. This, in, this inner block knows about the outside binding, but the outside binding where I'm trying to evaluate some variable does not know about the inside binding. Um, yeah, and so it works, it, it's the same thing for uh, method definitions as it's for blocks. And you, some examples of you that you might have seen that break this um, like general rule or instance variables, like they are accessible throughout the whole instance binding. So at the top level of the, of a, like in the initialize method, you assign a binding of your, of any Ruby class you create. And that binding is available from any other method in that class. Uh, as long as you use an instance variable. And that's kind of what the instance variable tells you to do, is like look at the class level binding and operate off of that. Uh, class variables you may have also used, and that's just where kind of you have a class and then usually you do it in the, the best, my favorite computer science term, screaming case, which is just all caps with uh, underscores. And the reason those are available in any method are because they're defined at the you're def they're defined within the block of the class, and the methods are also defined in the block of the class. And so, uh, because inner bindings know about outer bindings, you can access that class variable. Uh, and the other one that you may not have used are global variables, and these are defined on what is known as the top level binding, which is, uh, as it sounds like, just like the binding. Uh, inside which all other bindings are defined and it's you can you can access that if you really want to it's uh, all all uppercase top level underscore binding I don't know why you want to use that but you can if you want to anyway so that's what that's what global variables do that and again the uh, dollar sign just tells like I want to look for this variable on the top level binding um, this is, yeah, that makes no sense. Forget that. Here we go. So now, in this case, I have a method that def defines a variable, just one equals one, and I return the binding of that method. And so I can define the variable, or I can call the define variable method, and it, if I then evaluate the one variable on that binding, it will actually return the value. So that's kind of how you can break uh, the binding, like the, the, the general concept of outside layers don't know about the uh, inside bindings variables. Anyway, so that was a lot. Uh, in this case, for the purpose of the shell, all we're going to do is define, we're going to assign the binding of the in initialize method to a instance variable so we can access it anywhere. And now we have one binding available everywhere that we can use. And so instead of kernel.eval.command, we're just going to pass it. It's a second optional argument that represents, uh, that is the binding in which to evaluate this, uh, this command. And by default, the second, um, the second argument is just the current binding of the scope. And so by doing that, now we can assign variables 
at the top here, and I can access them later, which is pretty cool. So now we have a shell that can accept and evaluate Ruby over multiple lines, which is pretty neat. Next up, let's try to define some methods and classes. And I, I, you may be thinking, but wait, we just said we can write Ruby over multiple lines. Can, and, like, can't we define methods and classes over multiple lines? And the answer is not really. Uh, I mean, you can. Uh, if you do it on a single line, you can write methods and it will work. But if you try to do it over multiple lines, it will return a syntax error. And that's because at the moment, as soon as you press enter in the shell, it's going to ship whatever you've typed to the, uh, to the kernel.eval. And so if I just try to define the first part of a method, that's, you, there's a, it needs an end for a method to be defined, so it doesn't actually work. And so this was a really tough one that I had to think about a lot, and so I decided I would look at IRB a little bit for this one. So at the top, uh, I decided to go right from the root. So when you type IRB, what you're really doing is saying, uh, evaluate the IRB file, or yeah, evaluate the IRB file in your bin directory. And this is what it, this is what it is. It, it comes with your uh, Ruby core installed on your machine. All it does is require IRB and it runs the irb.start function method. Uh, here is the module that it was calling earlier. Uh, it just a lot of this is not important. At the the top half is just defining the settings in which to create with which to create the uh, IRB instance. And the bottom half is just uh, creating that instance and running it. And so this is the initialize method of IRB. Uh, it, and these uh, three instance variables do all the work. First, you have the top uh, at context variable. Uh, that essentially stores the state and the configuration of the IRB. Um, session and that's stuff like uh, output where you, like where you output to uh, if you specify a custom prompt which you can do it turns out uh, that's where it's stored uh, stuff like that next we have this signal status which is a really cool thing where um, it defaults to in IRB which is like the top level and then as you input stuff into IRB it switches from uh, in IRB to one of in input, in eval, in load, and then back to in IRB. And that's how IRB knows like what to do with the input you're giving it. So like the way it treats input when, for instance, you're in eval, which is when it's actually sending the code to the interpreter and like running it, is different than when you're saying in load, which is, I actually don't remember, I think it might be when you're like loading a file. Either way, they're both like places where it doesn't want to, like it's, everything's locked up, so it still wants to be able to receive input, but it doesn't want to do anything with it, so it just holds on to it until, you, until it's done. Anyway, and then the last thing is the scanner method, and this is the really beefy thing, thing that like, uh, is responsible for collecting and running the code. Uh, so it is the, the biggest like, black box of this whole thing. And basically, once you get past the initialization method, it gets horribly complex, and it's not worth. I'm not going to show it to you because it's real ugly. Um, the I, I, I looked through the commit history of IRB, and most of it was written. Uh, I think the last like major commit was probably 10 or 15 years ago, and so uh, it's really uh, it, it's gathers some dust, and it's really hard to read and the number of like single letter variables just made my head hurt. So I didn't, I, I dug through it, I promise. I looked into it. It's not worth reading, trust me. <laughs> but anyway, so we're gonna start with like what it does. And I, I, instead of like showing code, I'm gonna show a flow chart. So first thing it does is it uh, gets user input with io.gets and it uses io just because rather than uh, in our case, we just had a terminal and just used kernel.gets. It 
wants to store the history of stuff you've written, so it creates a temporary I.O. file so that it can remember what you've typed. Uh, after that, uh, it, lo it looks the user it looks for the, in the user input for expression starting words, and this is something I came up with because I didn't know how to describe it. But I'm just going to go through a quick list of what some of them are, and this is surprisingly not exhaustive. Uh, so you have stuff like class module and function definitions. You have block start, so begin, do, and then open curly brace. You have if, else, case, etc. You have looping stuff, while, until, for. You have Boolean operators, the double pipes, or the little literal or, and then the same for and. You have uh, comparators, so greater than, equal to, all that stuff. Uh, you have collection uh, openings, so stuff that starts arrays, hashes, or, and I included a, uh, I included the parenthesis in this just because, I mean, it has a lot of uses. It can define the start of an expression or it can start to define a method call. I'm just including it here because I thought it looks most similar to those. Uh, you have like math operators and it, like not, they're not always math operators, but it's in a column. You have stuff that starts strings or reg regular expressions. And that's, that's actually it. Uh, Obviously, there are more here, but I kind of condensed them down into the major groups. So, reminder, this is where we were. It's, it's looking for those, and once it sees those, if it doesn't find any, then it just says, cool, let's just throw it straight at our interpreter, and so it evaluates. If it does find them, though, and I defined a small variable here, uh, the total number of starting words found is now s. Uh, if it does find those, then it starts looking for the uh, keywords that end up those expressions. So for instance, um, for a class definition, it would look for the keyword end. And it counts the number of, of those that it finds. And it's, it's actually worth noting that it's literally counting them. It's not looking for like, okay, so we have, we have a list. It doesn't keep a list of the starting expression starting words and then try to match them up with uh, their ending words. It literally just keeps a count. And so that's like an interesting little uh, pit you can fall into. If you, if you try to end a do block with a close curly brace, it will try to run it, is basically what I'm saying. Even though like anyone would know that's not valid. Uh, anyway, here's a list of the expression ending words. You have end, of course, uh, the closing curly brace, parenthesis, and array, and then strings. Uh, so if the number of ending words is greater than or equal to the number of starting words, then it will evaluate. And it really is greater than or equal to. If you type in an extra end, then it will try to evaluate it and you'll get a, a syntax error. Otherwise, it will uh, go back to the prompt and start collecting more input until it is a complete statement. Anyway, so that's a lot of work. Uh, I'm not going to do it like as thorough as IRB did it, because like that would just take way too long. I don't care to write that many regular expressions, frankly. So I dumped it in a lot. Uh, start with, I wanted to extract the input into a separate class because it, it needs to know. We need to know a lot about the input, and so it makes sense to throw it into its own class and give it its own uh, logic. And so it has an attribute value, and that it is initialized to an empty string. Uh, I defined a clear and append method, and so the clear will be used once we evaluate the Ruby. It, we, we no longer want to keep the old, the old expression around, so we clear out the string. Uh, and then the append is just when we, want, when we have multiple lines of Ruby, we want to concatenate those, those commands all together to form a single chain. Um, I defined a very condensed uh, list of keywords that are expecting the end keyword. So I just, in this case, I'm just doing class module and function definitions, as well as begin and do blocks, and then if and unless. So that's like, you, you can, I think you can, that's probably Turing complete. So in, in, in theory, I'm writing something that could solve any problem. Uh, and then with that, 
list of keywords, we're going to loop over them and for each keyword, we're going to define a reg regex here. And uh, regexes are like weird sometimes. It's either uh, a word boundary or a non-word character. So basically I'm looking for a space or uh, a period in the case of a method call. Or no, I don't a non-word boundary. Or uh, th this carrot just means the start of the string. Uh, turns out you can string interpolate regular expressions, which I didn't know, but that's kind of cool. And then after that, we, we want a non-word character and then the, or the end of a string. And that's just so that in the case where I define a variable named uh, ending, for instance, it doesn't interpret that as the end keyword. Uh, and so then we're going to, excuse me, we're going to take the value, which again stores the uh, user, the user's provided input up to this point. We're going to scan that string, and that and the scan method on string just takes a, a regex and uh, it grabs all the instances in the string that match that, and then we're going to just find the length of it. And so, for each iteration, we're going to have the number of times that keyword appeared in our string. And then once we have all those, we're just going to sum them all together. So we have a total number of expressions starting keywords. Uh, so then we, if we know the number of starting keywords, then we also need to know the number of ends. This is a much simpler one. We just literally count the number of times we see end with a uh, word boundary or beginning or end of string around it. And then I just defined a uh, question mark method to uh, see if the total number of ends is greater than or equal to the number of, of words expecting an end. So now, uh, say we want to, just, just because I'm writing multi-line uh, arrays and patches is pretty common, I wanted to do that one as well. So in this case, because um, they each need their own specific variant of an ending word, I defined a hash where the first one, the, the key is the uh, expression starting and the, the value is the ending one. So then we are going to loop over those. We're going to count the number of uh, collection starters. So again, that's a brace, array, or parenthesis. We're going to count the number of those. We're also going to count the number of enders, uh, which is, again, is a closing, of all, closing variant of all those. Uh, we're going to see if the number of starters is equal to the number of ends. And if so, then we are going to, we're, we're going to use this uh, all method, which just says, is every single value in this array truthy? So that means that if we have one of the, if one of the collection starting keywords does not have the associated ender, then this will evaluate to false. Uh, I, did just realize that if I accidentally put two enders, then it will it will not evaluate still, which is not great. But that's you know it's it's an MVP. Anyway, so then I wrote a top level helper method that checks if all the uh, keyword starters are matched and all the collection starters are matched. Uh, and so now we can integrate that back into our shell object from earlier. Uh, so at, at the very beginning, we're going to create a new input value. Uh, when we receive new user input, we're going to append that most recent input to the existing input. Uh, let's see. Here. Oh, we're going to wrap the evalu evaluation of the input in this uh, else if input is dot ready to evaluate. So we're not going to evaluate input until it's ready to be evaluated. And so in the case where one of those checks fails, then it will keep collecting user input. And so let's see if it works. So in this case, I am defining a counter method. All it's going to do is count to five in the most asinine way possible. And so it collected the class, and now if I call the cl that class, 
hey, it works. So yeah, we, now we have a working multi-line shell. Uh, and so that's it, that's all I wrote. Uh, it was a really fun, really dumb project. Uh, I don't expect to ever use this again. Uh, it's not in a GitHub repo, so like, don't ask me to contribute to it. Um, but I'm just gonna go through some of the takeaways I got from this whole exercise. Uh, one thing that was really cool is that it kind of forced me to think about like how Ruby is structured as a language and how it uh, is similar to some languages and different from other languages. For instance, um, the like trying to think about like what are all the, the keywords I use most commonly was a really good practice to think and like really made me think about like how to design code and. Uh, this is like less about how Ruby is different, but I never really thought of uh, like variable scope in a Ruby context. And, and like, the, like uh, I know we talk we talk about it all the time in like JavaScript because it's so messed up. Uh, but it was really cool to to try to think about that stuff in Ruby for a little bit. Uh, I also learned this is actually about that binding thing I just talked about it was it was just a really cool thing to like dive into and how it works and like all that stuff uh, and then the last takeaway I had is that IRB is an amazing piece of technology that I never want to open again it's a it is a truly beautiful hot mess uh, yeah and that's it My, my shell will not do that, so don't, don't try it. But uh, in IRB, it's manner of do it like so. It's really weird. It like it takes all the keywords in Ruby, like literally all of them, and defines a special class. Like it defines a group of classes for each of them, and each of those classes have a different uh, way that IRB handles it. Uh, let me see if I can pull up the um, source code just for a quick, like, example. Let's see. Uh, I'll put this up on the screen just so you can. So in case you ever want to. Uh, Look at the Ruby source code. Looks great. Maybe so. <laughs> so there's uh, literally a GitHub repo. I don't. I don't believe this is the master version. This is just the a, a, a copy of the source code. But uh, bin just contains all of the like Rubyism, like the the command line Ruby stuff that you run. Has a bunch of stuff that I uh, with a lot of C that I didn't want to read. And then you have this lib. It's like very similar to like a how a Ruby demo would be structured. You go onto lib, lib, and it has all the modules listed, such as like bundler, CSV, uh, net HTTP, etc. So I can come into IRB, uh, and then it just has like the definition of everything. And then if you want to see like uh, where was it? What's Ruby token. So this def this this is the one that defines all the keywords. Uh, let me see if I can find one. Yeah. So here it defines like. Sorry, I wasn't talking to Mike this whole time. Uh, Ruby the IRB defines like a keyword value for what the like okay a, a symbol value for what the keyword is. Uh, this. Thing here is a class that represents how IRB will handle it. Um, this is like the literal string of the keyword. And then the final object in the array is, um, I think it is like a, like the final ones are just like additional options for like what 
like in, in some cases they need to define additional options. For instance, like yeah, if you look at like if and unless, it has an extra option that just allows for uh, single line evaluation. So then down here it does some great metaprogramming where it uh, it loops over all of the constants somewhere. Oh yeah. Well, anyway, it loops over all the constants and then defines a new method on, uh, actually, that's cool, it uses a val. So it uses a val to define classes based on these uh, keywords. So that, that's kind of how IRB does it. It's pretty, pretty complex, but also kind of cool. It's, it's, it's worth noting that, I'm, I'm going to not answer your question. Uh, <laughs> it's worth noting that I did not write an interpreter here. <laughs> All I did was, it's more like I define something that collects Ruby and then ships it off to someone else's interpreter. So, but in theory, we could sub it out for a different interpreter if you want to get on that. Like if you want to write your own interpreter, I'm happy to use it. Yeah, I, I don't. I've never seen the source code of like uh, tryruby.org, for instance. But uh, I believe what it does is it like it does something very similar to this, where it uh, collects it and then it doesn't have to do as much like parsing whether it should continue to collect, but it does like do pretty extensive stuff. To, like I think it, a lot of them like disable like backticks, for instance. So you can't just like remove the whole app directory on the server. Yeah. Uh, Stuck, like, yeah. It, it, so I, I imagine that's what they do. It's pretty, probably pretty similar to like, it, like reading the Ruby code and then disabling certain aspects of it. Yeah. I like to think they execute everything in IRB, but first they redefine every dangerous class or method possible. <laughs> just monkey patch all the Ruby. Yeah. That's no, not the worst idea. <laughs> I think it'd be pretty fun if they like, like read it and then uh, immediately like re like refuse to evaluate it, but then like send some like like a redirect to like I don't know some like Chinese website that like scolds them for <laughs> trying to ruin their service. Any other questions? Neat. Thank you.